welcome another episode of the nonprofit show. So glad you're here today joining us with Bloomerang for Nonprofit Power Week. And in the hot seat, we have Ann Fellman. Uh, Julia Patrick and I are just so thrilled to have Ann joining us today as uh, she is here to talk to us about first time donor journey and what you might need to do to get that second gift. So stay with us. Um, Anne's got several tips and techniques that she's going to share with you. And um, this entire week is dedicated to Bloomerang Nonprofit Power Week, where we really dive deep on several uh, subjects and conversations. So yesterday we kicked off with uh, Josh and so uh, grateful to have him kick off this week. And uh, we have, you know, the rest of the week dedicated to these episodes as well with Bloomerang. So thank you so much, Ann. We also want to remind you who we are, if you are viewing um, or listening. listening. Leah Patrick's here today, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group, your nonprofit nerd. And for Valentine's, I just have to show my super nerdy love glasses. I can't keep them on the entire show, but I did want to be a little <laughs> bit of a uh, festive as, as we sit here today. So uh, so glad to be alongside you, Julia, for these conversations. And we have to also give a huge shout out of gratitude to our besties over at Bloomerang, the entire team that have been with us, honestly, since the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as your part-time controller. Thank you to these companies that have uh, committed their mission to your mission and to help you do more good throughout your community. Hey, if you missed any of our episodes, we're coming up on four years, 700 plus episodes. I know, Julia, it's it's just like mind blowing. <laughs> it, um, it feels like yesterday, doesn't it? But you can find us on Roku, YouTube. Vimeo, Fire TV. And for those of you that are podcast listeners, uh, go ahead and cue us up there too. Wherever you stream your podcast, you can find the nonprofit show. And just a few hours later, you will find this episode that we are recording live and interviewing live with Ann Fellman, CMO, Chief Marketing Officer at Bloomerang. Welcome back, Ann. Thank you. I'm, I've been looking forward to this day. I'm really excited to be here. So we appreciate the nonprofit show very much. Absolutely. You know, and I, I say this all the time, uh, Jared and I talk about this privately, but one of the really unique qualities we think about our partnership with you, and, and at first I thought you were just trying to behave and, and seem like good partners, but now I realize it's in your corporate DNA. You share, and you share information with people who are not necessarily your clients. And so, one of the, the things about this uh, Nonprofit Power Week with you all is a lot of times organizations that have this have invested in this information and this knowledge, they won't give it out unless you're part of their client base. And so it is such a powerful thing for us to be able to engage your talent base and have them share. I would say, Jarrett, and you probably you probably have an opinion too, expensive information right? Yeah. It's really cool. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Well, thank you, Julia. It's, it is central to our DNA. So yes, we are focused on making great software that's really easy to use to help nonprofits. But we also equally important is create the content, the resources and make it available for free. Um, and so that's why we love things like this, because there's just a wealth of information that our team has the opportunity to engage with other nonprofits and you know, learn from in them. And then how do we lift that up and serve that up to the broader community? Because we're, we're here, we're here to maximize the, help maximize the impact for all nonprofits. So yeah. really pleased to be here. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. And we see you doing it day in and day out. And part of this discussion that we're going to have today, and, and I think we don't have an, have it enough is about the concept of first time donor behavior. I love you use the word journey, which I think is a fabulous, fabulous word. Why is this important? Well, let's start with a few data points that you, some of you might be familiar with, but the first time donor retention rate on average is about 18%, just over 18%. 
can you imagine if we only kept 18% of our donors, um, how hard it would be to keep our organizations going? Um, <laughs> when you get on the flip side, when you get to that second gift, you raise that retention rate up to 60% plus. So there's a real there there's a real opportunity of you've you've convinced them the the first step in the journey right um, to say hey what you're doing is interesting and valuable and I want to have a role in that so now let's let's tap into that mm -hmm. uh, so it's a really really important piece of when we think about the long term sustainability of our organizations and what we're doing is yeah. get them coming back. It takes some the, work. <laughs> takes some work. And Josh mentioned that yesterday. So again, this entire power week kind of builds and stacks on top of each other. So feel free and go back to watch yesterday's episode where Josh talked about these three trends that we want to look at. And this first time donor is one of them, as well as that donor retention. And you're right, Anne. Imagine if we were a storefront and we only had 18% of those customers return the next year. So, you know, as you talk about this, like how are some ways that we can get these donors not only to like come back, but to stick around? And I have to, you know, as we think of Valentine's today, I can only imagine that there needs to be some love shared. <laughs> yeah, definitely love. So love with that thank you note. Personalized thank you note. You might think, oh, I don't have time to write a big long letter. It doesn't have to be a big long letter, but the handwritten note, and that can take a lot of different forms. So you might think of your classic note card um, and handwriting that note. That sure, that is one approach. I received, I made a donation recently to an organization and they had their form letter, but then they had one of the um, kind of founders of the organization handwrite me a note and say, thank you so much for helping me and my friends. We really appreciate it. So there was that handwritten component. And I'm telling you about it because it stuck with me. Uh, it was really <laughs> meaningful to me to get that little extra um, thank you on top of. It can be personalized thank yous. Yes, it could be written. It can be a phone call. And here's where I'm going to go with this for a second. Okay. Phone calls um, are very powerful as well when it comes to personalized communication and thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it speeds the gift to a phone call can speed a gift uh, that speeds the time to the second gift. Um, but also think about it this way. When sometimes I don't get, you know, that person on the line, there's visual voicemail. A lot of times we read our voicemail on our phones now. And so you can think of that as get that personalization in right away. Hey, Sally, thanks for your gift. You know, so there's there's a lot of different ways that you can make that connection and that personalization to say thank you and to express your gratitude for their contribution. Oh, Anne, I'm so glad you mentioned that because voicemails, um, you know, often I think if someone doesn't recognize the number, they might not answer, but you're so right. And I read those messages all the time, you know, uh, the voicemail message and, and how it dictates that. So I'm so glad you mentioned that when it comes to personalizing the thank yous. What about like, is there an opportunity to engage the clients or those we serve in the personalization? Absolutely. I mean, when you think about stories, right, and stories of the most powerful thing of, of what, you know, your gift means to me, yeah. um, you can incorporate video, maybe, depending on your organization and your cause and all that good stuff, um, engaging, engaging with recipients of donations, mm -hmm. um, just helping to share the impact. I have a fun story. I talked to a, a major gift officer. So she received an initial do donation from an organization. Sometimes people are doing that to kind of test you to see how you come back around. She wrote that handwritten thank you. And that donor came back and gave $25,000. And they said, I, this is kind of, you know, this is an awesome story. But what they said was it was the first time in 20 years that I actually received a real piece of mail. Like somebody wrote me a letter. Yeah. Um, so that's like, don't underestimate the power of, the personalized thank you. <laughs> I think everyone right now, Julia and Anne, they're like writing thank you notes, you know, like just hoping that they have one of those uh, unicorns and their constituency base too. That is such a great story. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you might feel overwhelmed, right? Or you have a lot of thank yous to do. Tap, bring those stock and note cards to your next board meeting and say, we're going to take 10 minutes and you're each going to write a note to 
so-and-so, um, just different ways. So how, how do you scale, especially if you're limited from a staffing resource perspective and, and time? Um, so there's a lot of different techniques you can apply to get that personalized thank you out quickly. Well, I think it's a great thing for volunteers. I think there are a lot of people that would just love to do that. Um, and it is, again, I agree with you. We're not getting enough things in snail mail. And it is, it's, it's also the right thing to do. You know, it is the right thing to do. And so to getting our, our donors to that second piece, huge. Another point that you have for us to help us understand the donor journey to a second gift, you talk about sending more information about your nonprofit. So what does that look like? Think about this. So a lot of times we think about the um, stages of a donor journey up to that first donation. Mm -hmm. There is then the clock starts ticking. There's a window of time. There's about a, a, a nice little 90 day window where you can accelerate that speed to a second gift. So it isn't the ask right away, but it's that cultivation, right? It's tell me about your programming right? Mm -hmm. Tell me about the impact of my gift and acknowledge that and what that equates to. Mm -hmm. um, stories are a fabulous way, right? Um, take a, take it a personal story. You can send uh, your mission. If you've got a video uh, around your mission and some of the, the programming that you're doing, sending those impact statements, infographics, other things, help me understand how the donations are going to work and the impact that they're making in the in the community. Um, that's a really important component of bringing me along the way on, you know, what's going on there. So it's about different little touch points along the journey um, where you're just engaging with them and, and teaching them about the different ways that they're making a difference in the community. I love that you mentioned that 90 day window and yeah, I can't me too. help but think about automation, right? Like Bloomerang has so many opportunities for that and to really engage in a personalized manner, even, you know, albeit, um, aut you know, automatically talk to us about some of those ways. Cause I, and I, and I know I'm putting you on the spot here, Anne, but you know, there's so many ways you mentioned capacity, you know, like we don't have that much time. Like what are some ways that we can still, you know, provide this impact, more information to the nonprofit um, or to the donor for the nonprofit in that 90 day window? Right. So the best thing to do is to map out your what we call like in the marketing world, your cadence or your sequence. So first take a step back and do some planning and say, OK, we got that first donation. What are my defined touch points along the way, right? And what's my goal of communicating with them? I'm not making any asks. I'm simply engaging with them and, and teaching them about our organization because I want to turn them into, you know, a really strong advocate and fan for what we're doing. And I want to keep them coming back. So map out, it can be emails. Emails are nice, but then you want to layer in other touch points, right? Maybe there are opportunities to participate, different events or activities. Tell them about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, tell them stories about um, your mission and things that are going on there. Um, and just keep, you know, keep bringing them along. So a great example, acknowledging that gift. So I'll tell you a story of I made a donation to an organization and I was doing some research because I wanted to understand the impact of my gift a little bit further. And it was hard to find that information. And I remember when I made the first donation to the organization, I was like, wow, this is a really important cause. I'm really passionate about it right now. If they would come back and ask for a recurring donation at this month, I would absolutely say yes. Um, so I ended up, you know, took a little bit of time, ended up doing the recurring donation. And then recently I was doing some research on how much does it cost to help this child with special needs over a course of a year? I couldn't find the info. So I emailed the executive director and I found it, found out. I was like, oh, I should up my just, you know, another $50. I could actually help in my mind, realize that I'm helping a single child for an entire year with the education and therapy and all these great things. Mm -hmm. And so, but it's just a little bit of the storytelling and um, finding those ways to touch along the way, because that donor might be thinking about, I'm excited about your cause and what you're doing. So fi finding different ways to tap into um, my excitement and passion through educating me on the impact of a gift. 
Yeah. And Julia, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm guilty of this. I'll have a predetermined amount in my head. I go to the website and I'll say, I'm going to donate $25. And then they have that. Here's what $40 will do. And I'm like, okay, I'll do 40 instead of 25. So your story and, you know, is something that I think many of us can probably improve. I'm glad you got the information that you received, but what if we were able to package that and, and to share that story so that you, the donor, any donors out there, right. Don't have to do that research. That to me is a huge takeaway. Right, right. It's a real opportunity because, again, I've looked at a lot of organizations and from large national organizations to very small local nonprofits. And it, I found it really hard, regardless of the size. So I think we've got an opportunity to tell the story and to pull that pull on that thread, if you will, of this, you know, this much can um, support a family to have a clean water filtration system or whatever it might be. It was like, wow, that's it. You know, it's it's amazing. Um, what a few data points like that, but layering it into the the human element or the the storytelling aspect of the impact of the gift. Yeah. Well, it makes it real, and I think that's part of this this journey is that, you know, we are trying to to make this a real uh, championship opportunity. Somebody can be the champion of a mission of you know with an impact. But if you don't know, you're looking at the forty dollars versus oh, $100 is going to solve this problem, right? And so it changes the conversation and I think the mentality with which, you know, our, our donors operate. So I love this. I think this is a really smart way to go. Another thing that you advise us on that donor journey to a second gift is highlighting volunteer opportunities. Okay, this is not one that we hear about in conjunction with this conversation. And we should be talking about this. Right. Um, giving is not just with donations, but it's also with our time, right? And it's a very powerful way to help move that. So tell me about what you have planned. So as you're thinking about that donor cultivation and next step is then, hey, highlight the ways that I can get involved because I'm really passionate and excited about it. Tell me about the events you have planned. Maybe you're doing some outings where you're, just, you're bringing your donors together or maybe you're having a donor recognition event. That might be an idea for, for some of you out there. Um, but also just the volunteer opportunities. How can I engage a little bit a little bit more? Um, I Again, I've been making some donations lately, but um, made a donation. And then uh, we had a conversation around ways to get involved. And so I was, I said, well, my husband's really talented at basketball. He could do a basketball clinic. And then we just start, started talking about different volunteer opportunities to engage. So it was a really nice way to kind of build trust. Again, it's all, this is a relationship business, right? So highlighting those opportunities to connect, whether it's volunteering, if you don't do don't really have a strong volunteering program, think of different events, different activities, different ways to bring people that are passionate about your organization together to, you know, we're, we're humans, we're social. And if you're in a situation where you can bring us together, um, really amazing things can happen from that energy. Yeah. You know, one thing that we've seen over the last three years is potentially a dip in that volunteer activity because of, you know, access to programs or, or closeness to people. Um, but I think that's really coming back now, Anne. And I, I love the opportunities and the innovation that's coming, you know, around volunteers, IRL in real life, Julia. Thank and you. I, so I love that you mentioned that, you know, it's like, let's think, let's think outside the box. What are ways that we can continue to immerse these donors, you know, to become more fully engaged in who we are and what we do. So um, that's, that's really important. Uh, one of the things you're going to talk to us and I like, cannot wait to nerd out and, and hear you nerd out about it and is to track, you know, an appeal to donor preferences. So is this, are you talking about like donor segmentation? How, how are you suggesting that we can really track this? Yeah. Well, there's a couple layers to this. So let's unpack this yeah. for a second. So tracking one. Uh, so we just talked about kind of the journey and defining that life cycle of your donors and their journey and what phases you want to move them to. Kind of step two is, do you have a good system in place, right, that you can actually track your interactions with them, right? Uh, whether they're emailing with you or you're having phone conversations or they're volunteering, 
is it easy for you to do that, right? To track that. So that's an important kind of baseline piece, but to appeal to donor preferences, one of the things that is, um, I'll say the one of the most cost-effective or I, I hate to say the word cheap because it, time is expensive too, mm -hmm. but surveys, right? Understand your donor preference. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways in which you can, you know, different topics that you can survey your donors to understand, you know, what are the things, you know, why did they donate? What are the things that they care about? What types of, you know, maybe they are interested in certain, certain types of volunteer opportunity, really understanding, um, getting their input, what they care about, what they want to hear about from you, right. And being able to, um, understand that track that in your system and then you can get into the segmentation right and then you can it, it gets into the per, back to the personalization component when you understand okay Jarrett really cares about volunteer opportunities so maybe you have a volunteer newsletter I'm going to send if make sure it's okay I'm going to send Jarrett um, information around volunteering but that survey piece takes a little bit of time to write it. You might want to sample it depending on how big your population is, but be ready to commit to whatever you're asking for from them to say, yeah, we can support that or, um, you know, be committed to the types of questions that you're asking that you're actually going to honor those preferences that they share with you. Mm -hmm. That's really important. I love that. And I love, again, it ties back to this word journey, but understanding kind of the flow and being ready to navigate it and not just start something that you can't finish. It's, this is a, this is bigger thinking and it's going to take, you know, a, a, a little bit more of um, a structure to kind of understand how this plays out. One of the things that I really want to end strongly with, because I love this and of course it is Valentine's day and who could forget our favorite little Valentine hearts, but, I got to ask this question, the magic of matching gifts, man, I think this is something we don't do enough and it's so powerful. How can we engage folks in this? Well, there's some great tools and technologies out there that make it really easy, especially if you're asking for donations online of, Hey, check if my employer has a matching gift. Double donation is a great example of that. But before we get into like how, how to do that or whatever, the, the, the data is really compelling. So if you're not doing this, look at more than half of Fortune 500 companies offer matching gift programs today. Those are the really big companies, even small companies like Bloomerang. We offer a matching gift program. We actually today <laughs> put um, $25 in every employees because we wanted to share the love today, actually, oh, love with that. our employee base. So everybody is out there donating to their cause of, of, of choice. But there's about... Um, you know, 2 billion that passes through the corporate matching gift program in the U S. So there's, there's, you know, there's money there. Wow. And so it's a missed opportunity if we're not tapping into that and reminding is now let's say you don't have the means necessarily to kind of layer in something like a double the donation where you can, the donor can automatically look up to see and then connect. Um, once they make that first donation. So again, that follow up, tell them about your organization, in that 90 day window, then at some point in that stage, make a decision of when we're going to educate them on, ask them if they have a matching gift program and teach them how to go pursue that. If they're going to, you know, if the company they work for has a matching gift program, um, give them some guidelines. There's fabulous resources out there. If you just Google matching gift donation, you'll find all kinds of resources of how to do that. We've got lots of great articles on our site. Um, but it's a really, really, really powerful um, way to, you know, expand that gift. Really you important. Know, and I never, ever, ever thought of this as a touch point in that 90 day cycle. I mean, had you, Jared? Because I love this concept. You know, I, I've heard of it, but I don't see it implemented very well. And you mentioned, and I mean, there are some automation ways. And I really think getting to know the donor, because I have to be honest, ladies, I see so many donor databases and many organizations do not know 
the employer of their donors. And so getting that piece of data is critical to that, to this matching gift piece, Julia. So I really think it comes from, you know, that first time donor, as we started this entire conversation, getting to know them, you know, like really getting to know them, taking the time. And as Anne said, it might mean you have to take a step back, just take a step, you know, deeper. And I think it's so critical, but during this 90 days, you know, this matching gift, as you said, Anne, is a great touch point. Right. And there's all, you know, different uh, companies have different rules on their matching gift windows, the time frame. So there are some time frames there. Sometimes it's within when that gift was received. Sometimes it's certain times a year around end of year or tax. So um, especially now, if you brought in a lot of donors here at the end of the, you know, the end of 2022, Mm -hmm. Now might be a good time to just layer in a matching gift reminder to those new donors to see if we can't um, pull some of that in right now. Um, so there's a definite opportunity here. Again, layer that into that, that again, ways to engage, with. survey them. When you survey them, find out if they're willing to share with you who they work for. So again, then you can go, oh yeah, they do have a matching gift program. You can you can look that up pretty easily. That's what I was thinking. That's a great way to collect the data is that survey. I'm curious, Anne, um, you know, do you recommend an annual donor survey or how often yeah. should we be surveying our donors? Well, I, I always like to think about it a little bit differently. Um, Uh, I think about like kind of um, cohorts, if you will, or of when donors kind of come in. So there's that end of year donor. Now's a great time. If they're brand new to your organization, reach out to them and get to know kind of their preferences, what, what, what caused them to donate, those types of things. And then I like to think about like my ongoing. So again, segment your donor population, your first time donors, and then windows of time of when they came in. Think about your long time, your recurring donors. You might want to ask them a different set of questions because you may have different information on them already, right? So segment how you think about surveying than just sending everybody the same survey every year. So take a step back and think about what do we want to learn and understand? What do we want to get better at on how we communicate, how we engage, how we get them excited about our mission? I love that cohort mentality. That that's another big takeaway. We've had several with you, Anne, uh, Chief Marketing Officer. I I love all of this. I knew it was going to be a super nerdy conversation, uh, you know, to match yesterday with Josh. So for those of you watching and listening, thank you. We're not quite done, but I do want to make sure that you have Anne's contact information. Anne Fellman serves as the Chief Marketing Officer, CMO at Bloomerang. So very grateful to have your time and expertise with us here today, uh, Anne. And then also the entire team uh, at Bloomerang. Thank you so much. And I love that they're sharing the love today. So, uh, you know, hearing that Julia has really just, I I saw your reaction to it as well. Uh, Such a great opportunity to go out and, you know, and elevate our community. So thank you. Yeah. Super great idea. I I'm going to borrow that one. I think that is really clever and a great way to uh, reinforce, you know, your commitment to the nonprofit sector. It's been amazing. Hey, again, it's been amazing to be with you again. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself. I like to call her my nonprofit nerd, but she can be yours as well. This is a really exciting time for us because we don't do this very often. Nonprofit Power Week only comes a couple times throughout the year. And so during this week, we're going to be talking about a lot of things. As Jarrett said, they all stack together. But if you've missed some episodes or more, you want to join us in future episodes, we're going to be talking about um, everything from giving trends to spring cleaning your donor database. Can't wait to hear about that. And then tax receding. What does that look like? And how can you make the process easier? And then we'll finish up the week with the five uh, biggest questions that you should be asking or thinking about when looking at at investing in a CRM. Um, Really a lot of fun content and something that you definitely want to be a part of. And again, we want to explain, express all of our, yeah, our heart, our love, especially today. <laughs> Jarrett, while I'm doing this, you got to put on those sexy glasses. Oh, I know. They they drop to the floor. So bear oh. with me. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to thank Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique. There she is. Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, the Nonprofit Nerd herself. 
and your part-time controller. these are the folks that have been with us um day in and day out and really let us share our love and our passion for the sector with all of you so thank you thank you thank you and i'm fired up to get re-engaged on this journey and to understand more and and really dedicate thought time to this process it's not a one and done thing 100 percent. not a one and done thing hey everybody on this special day of sharing our love and our passion we want to remind everyone to stay well so you can do well We'll see you back here for another fabulous day of Nonprofit Power Week with Boomerang.